Susie, really excited today. We have a good friend of ours, Greg Long, top 3% as a life coach um, in, uh, in the life coach arena, a Reaching Higher board member, instructor, Reaching Higher keynote uh, speaker. So excited for today's podcast. One of my very favorite people in the whole world. Mm-hmm. Greg, we're going to start out with um, you come in as one of our keynote speakers, and mm-hmm. the class is um, titled Limiting Beliefs. And um, I would just like you to share a little bit more in regards to the power of our beliefs, because in my mind, you have an amazing story, not just as to the power of limiting beliefs, but the power of positive beliefs. Can you share a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, Troy. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, Susie, yeah, too. Yeah, you too, Greg. Yeah, you know, one of, the, one of the things I'd love to talk about is how powerful one moment in our childhood can change our direction for life. Yeah. It's just one moment. It's not all the years of different incidents happening. It's not that I was raised in a particular environment. Or it's not that... I uh, failed over and over and over again. No, it's one moment. Mm -hmm. I can have a view of somebody that I say is important in my life. You know, like I really put them up there in a pedestal. Like this is really, whatever comes out of this person's mouth is really important, right? And then that person says something to me where it could be, you know, I don't think you're going to make it. I don't think you're smart enough. I think, you you know, that's out of your league. You should try something less. It takes one statement for somebody that importance. And then I make a decision about this statement. And then I live by the decision that I make. Mm. And the yeah. decision I make could be, I'm not going to try anymore. I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. I'm different. And in that moment, my future changes. It's not by the incident that happened. It's by the decision I made about it how I was listening to that person, where I put them in the sense of importance. Mm. So I got, you know, even today, you can get into a job or career or even at my age, you know, I can put somebody on a pedestal, misunderstand what they say, and then make a decision about it like I'm on the wrong path and then change my path based on that decision. Yeah. Right? So if I recognize that limited belief and I recognize the power of it, you know, I stand a chance. There's no guarantees, but then yeah. I stand a chance of navigating life on my terms instead of somebody else's. Yeah, and that's so powerful. That's yeah. so powerful. So talk a little bit about the flip side of that, the positive beliefs and maybe how you battle that in regards to, uh, in regards to that self-talk. Well, you know, <clears throat> that's a great question, Troy. One of the mm-hmm. things that I, I noticed about the positive beliefs, like a positive belief itself, if it's just thought and it's just planted inside of my head, makes really no difference. Yeah. You know, I have to start to declare it mm-hmm. because I'm really clear that life is created in language. Mm. You know, it only, you know, it's, it's what we speak. Yeah. You know, if you ever notice for yourself that, you know, you get up in the morning and your eyes feel really heavy. And then the first thing I do is turn to my spouse and go, wow, I'm tired today. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've just created a day now that I have to fight through the world that I created in language. Mm. Now, all that happened is my eyes were heavy. Yep. But once I label it and distinguish it and give it power, it becomes the truth. So true. So I have to be cautious of my speaking and check in every now and then. And I check in and go, okay, good. What world am I creating today? What world am I speaking into existence? What world am I uh, declaring to other people in their listening? Am I declaring a world that works as a possibility or am I declaring a world that sets me back and has it be hard and difficult yeah. and all those things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then I stand a chance. Yeah. And I like to say that in our class, our class is about public speaking. And in my mind, one of the things that I'll tell the students, hey, is it difficult? And do you have hesitancy? then you know it's right and it matters. And that's the importance of stepping into that and yeah. speaking truth audibly, too. Very much so. Very much so. Wow. So, Greg, our relationship started when you walked into my Dale Carnegie class years and years and years ago. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. Talk about the Dale Carnegie class and how it changed you. I mean, 
you're, you know, one of the top coaches in the world now and all the changes you've made. Talk about how Dale Carnegie and at that time, um, what your life was like and, and how it changed. Well, it, this is the funny, you know, I had a, a brilliant, brilliant coach back there. You know, I was in recovery for years, right? I mean, I was in recovery for a short time at that time, but I, I was uh, uh, a, an addict and a drunk on the streets for a long time, you know, for a period of time. And when I finally got sober, I realized I didn't have any life skills, right? So I had this brilliant, brilliant guy that I ran into. His name was Chauncey Costello. And Which... Chauncey made me go do Dale Carnegie, but he did it under the, he said, Greg, he says, listen, he says, I'm too old. He says, I can't sit in the classroom and I can't drive over there. You know, he was like 85 at the time. <laughs> so he says, I want you to go do Dale Carnegie and then tell me what they said. <laughs> he did, well, Chauncey did that. Chauncey did that. He was so, your coach. He was my coach at the time. So I did Dale Carnegie because Chauncey told me to do it. So I was going to deliver it to him. Little did I know what I'd get out of it, you know, out of being in Dale Carnegie. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the first time in my life I got to stand up and speak and be expressed and be acknowledged for I had value in life. Mm. You know, I realized during that Dale Carnegie that my past represented my value in life. And if I didn't share it, it had no value. It was a wasted 36 years. Mm. You know, and I learned that in Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie and Susie, you know. Here's one, you know, this is funny because if you take a look in your life, all of us, everybody take a quick look in your life. I, I showed up in the listening of somebody else. Now, if you take a really good look, you know, in your life, because once I say that, I said somebody believed in you until you could believe in yourself. I know. Right? And I only showed up in there listening. Susie said, Greg, you can do anything. And for the first time in my life, I believe somebody. Mm. It, you just happen to be that one. Now, everybody has one. Go back and look. Where did the one come from? Where is that one? Go find that one, right? Because yeah. I showed up in the listening of Susie. I couldn't create for myself looking in the mirror called, Greg, you can do anything. I didn't have yeah. that tool. But when Susie said it, I believed. And then once I believed, I started to take actions consistent with somebody who believed. Mm. It was so yeah. easy to believe in you. you know. And well, you could see it. But when you're stuck in it, you can't see it, right? So I need somebody in my life who can see the things that I can't see. Yes. You know, yes. it's like we were just talking <clears throat> earlier about watching yourself on video, right? I have never seen a video that I liked, right? <laughs> and then somebody says... Until this one. Until this one. Yeah, this one here, I already know. It's there coming off really good, right? Yeah, we practiced on this one. <laughs> But the idea was, I can't see the beauty in what I'm doing, yeah. but somebody else can see the beauty in what I'm doing. So I have to trust the listening of other people. Yeah. So. That's why we need each other. Exactly. That's empowerment. That's exactly. believing for someone until they believed for you know believed in it from themselves. That's what my instructor did for yeah. me at Carnegie, and that's what you do, and you pass along to everybody you coach. And to, to, to you know everybody you mentor, and you do so exactly. much for so many people, Greg. Yeah. You know, so. Well, I know what it felt like for me. It was like I got to step into a future that didn't exist before that moment. Mm. Yeah. You know, I was I was too busy practicing settling. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna settle right here. This is so much better than it was, so this must be good. I had no idea what was possible. Isn't that yeah. funny? How that's even a skill, and a habit. It, practicing the settling. It is, and we're masterful at it. We We're have. very masterful at going, okay, this is good enough. Yeah, I'm, I know. I'm comfortable now. I don't have to stretch myself. Don't say yes to that because that will make you uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you know, allowing yeah. it to be good and knowing yeah. that we're worthy of having good. Yeah, that's You know, right. stepping into it. And that's what we do in the Reaching Higher classes. You know, that's yeah, what you exactly. do when you go out and speak and all the different things. You know, you somebody asked me about Reaching Higher. They said, what is Reaching Higher? It says, well, I just love somebody exactly where they're at for eight weeks. Yep. And I just make them great. And at the end of eight weeks, they show up great. Yeah. And so great. It's Isn't great. that so simple? So simple. So, yeah. But so powerful. It yeah. is so powerful, right? So I have to deal with my judgments, my assessments, my yep. acceptance. I have to deal with all that stuff so it doesn't show up inside of my commitment to you. Yeah. yeah. There's so many people that have never been seen 
or never had mm-hmm. people speak positive things over their life. That's right. It's so powerful. It's yeah. it's it's all of us coming together. It is to be it the really best is. we can be. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that. Susie knows I love sayings, and one of the sayings that has stuck with me when I heard it is, "You cannot heal what you don't reveal." Mm. Ooh, I like that, mm-hmm. Troy. You think about yeah. your time mm-hmm. with Carnegie. That's that reminds me that you can't heal what you don't reveal. Yeah. It's very powerful. And, uh, you know, the funny part was in Carnegie, they give you a pen. <laughs> if you if you accelerate in a certain area, right? Yeah. There, there's 60 people in the course, and then all of a sudden you speak up, and then they vote you to see. You know, it was one of the most... I know it's a pen, right? The highest <laughs> award for achievement? It, it was a pen. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> but I was more—I was so proud of a pen that I couldn't get wait wait to get home and show my wife, look it, you know? Yeah. And then I'd bring home, and then by the time the course was over, I had like 11 pens, and I'd go, I am somebody, <laughs> you know? But it was a that symbol of being acknowledged for sharing. Who you are. And opening your heart and being at risk mm-hmm. that people recognized and gave you that small reward for which started out. All it takes is that little door opening where something's mm-hmm. possible and then the whole world is possible. Yeah, and the, th- the same thing happens in Reaching Higher. We get a chance to be authentic and to share our truth and to have people see us and accept us and love us just the way we are. Yeah. And we don't have to change anything. Like you say, Greg, there's nothing to fix because there's mm-hmm. nothing broken. That's mm-hmm. right. That's you know, right. And they get to see that they're, they're okay. Yeah. One of the principles that I love when you come in and you are one of our keynote speakers is the concept or the principle of looking for evidence, Mm, looking for evidence, especially as it relates to limiting beliefs that you say that statement in the morning. Let's say when you wake up, it's going to be I'm tired today. Yeah. And then how we go looking for evidence of that throughout the rest of the day. So can you share a little bit more about sure. that? Sure. You know, because, listen, one thing I've did, you know, I've worked with thousands of people now, right, over the years, mm-hmm. and there's none of us are unique. So if, I, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm thinking about it and doing it, I know everybody else is thinking about it and doing it, right? That's yep. what makes me such a good coach. I finally accepted the fact that we're all more alike than different. That's yeah. right. That's you know, right. so if I make a declaration in the world, <clears throat> like I did when I was very young, you know, I, I came back to school. There was a classroom at the end of the hall. It was Mrs. Craig's class. It was a class that only had six or eight people in there, right? Mm-hmm. And as fourth graders and fifth graders, we labeled that as the cl- people in that class, there's something wrong with them. Yeah. They're the dummies. You know, it's a small class. They, you know, they're, they're hidden at the end of the hall in a separate room. And I went home that summer, you know, a great summer. I thought everything was normal. And then I come back to school and guess whose class I was in? Mrs. Craig. I was in that class at the end of the hall, Mrs. Craig, the class for dummies. Yeah. And so I made a decision in that moment that there's something wrong with me and I'm different. Mm-hmm. Now, the moment I made that decision, <clears throat> my behavior and my actions were co- consistent with the declaration and what I said about myself. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't pass a test. I couldn't read a book. All of a sudden, I had these magical problems to show up. I, in reality, I think I just took it and ran because now I could lean on that and not be responsible for being anybody else. Mm. Yes. So there's two ways you can go. You can either lean on it and say, no, 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 or you can surrender to it. And I happen to surrender to it, I believe, that I surrendered to the story must be true. Mm. And the moment I surrendered to the story must be true, I look for evidence. Okay. And by the time I was in seventh grade, I found enough evidence that says something's wrong with me. I'm not, I can't be here, mm. right? Yep. And that's when I started my addiction mm. because the only thing that could take away that story was drugs and alcohol. Well, Greg. You know, mm. That's the only thing that could disappear, the story mm. that I created. Yeah. I created the story, but it was so real that when I put a drug in me or, an alcohol in, or some alcohol in me, the story didn't exist. Right, and once I notice it, go wow, the story doesn't exist when I do this. Then my whole la- life became about finding the next one, mm-hmm. yep. and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and it was just an endless journey of the, trying to repeat that first one, which never happened. Yep. Yep. I tried to f- repeat that wow. first experience, and the rest of the twenty years that I drank, it never happened again. Mm. So it was just this one after another, right? Now I know. Th- 
there was more to it than that. I, would, I basically had the gene that I react different to alcohol, but until I had that first drink, I didn't know that was sure. that thing that went on, right? Yeah. So, you know, the looking for evidence in any, and, you know, you ask, why do I look for evidence? Well, if I find enough evidence, it lets me off the hook for being responsible for going in a different direction, mm. right? Yeah. So same thing happened when, uh, when I finally got sober, right? I woke up one morning very unhappy, extremely unhappy. In Sylvan Lake. In Sylvan I Lake. I remember that story. Yeah. Well, this was before Sylvan Lake. This was, I woke up and I wasn't happy and I looked at my wife and I said, oh, she must be the problem. Mm. And the moment I said, she must be the problem, I spent the next year looking for evidence that I was right. She couldn't look pretty enough. She couldn't be the great mom. She couldn't clean the house right. She couldn't do anything right because I already decided she was the problem. And when I found enough evidence, I walked out of the relationship. I remember. Yeah. It was, a you know, and I was right. I justified it. You know, I went out and I go, okay, good. Now I got to prove the whole world that I'm right for leaving. Mm -hmm. So I had three relationships over the next three years. They all turned into my ex-wife within the... (laughs) <laughs> a short period of time. Something wrong with each one. <laughs> Something's wrong with each one. Why does God keep sending me these broken people? You know? Look at all this evidence. Look at yeah. all this evidence that it's not me, it's them. And then I had that that message that one night in Sylvan Lake where the tap on the shoulder says, you know, maybe it's not them. Maybe it's you. It was New Year's Eve. It was. Mm. Yeah. It was an awakening moment for you. It was completely... And so I went through that night, you know, it was, a, uh, it was one of the toughest times I ever had. Mm-hmm. I had two decisions to make. Either I could go find help and, and share this stuff, or I could go use a gun in the closet. Mm-hmm. You know, two choices. I know, I remember you talking about that. Yeah, I forgot I, about the gun in the closet. I made it through the night, and I, and I remember I, sitting in that night. It was one of the worst nights of my life because I got this vision. I got to see that this is the person you'd become. And there was no alcohol to hide it. There was no drugs to hide it. Yeah. Didn't have an excuse anymore. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And I remember getting down on my knees, and I don't know why to this day, because I didn't have a belief system in place, but I ran out of options. Yeah. And I think you start to find that spiritual human being when you run out of options. Mm-hmm. For those of you who haven't found one yet, there might be a moment, you know. And I promised that moment to repair all the damage I had done. Mm. And I went to work, and I went to the hotline, and that's where I met Chauncey. He was sitting there on New Year's Day. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. He's running the hotline. He's 50 (laughs) years sober. And I went in there, and I said, Chauncey, I've been a jerk. And I dumped and shared and dumped and shared. And he says, "Uh, the fact that you know you're a jerk means you stand a chance. And let's go to work. Wow. And within nine months uh, of going to work and becoming the father that I was supposed to be and becoming the human being I was supposed to be, I was remarried to my ex-wife. We got re- married in, was it Cancun? In Cancun. That yeah. was our honeymoon, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but one of the, the things that really that moment did is today I look for evidence that I, it's right. You know, yeah. Chauncey taught me that. He said, Chauncey, how'd you stay married? He, he'd stayed married 80 years. Died six days after his 80th wedding anniversary. I said, how on earth do you stay married for 80 years, for God's sake? That's like impossible. He goes, well, Greg, I learned a long time ago. He says, if I get up in the morning Mm. and choose Miss Vivian, I'm not window shopping. (laughs) What a cute thing to say. Profound, though, really. Isn't it brilliant? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I go, oh. Being grateful for what you have. I get to choose every single day. I get to choose Mm. my experience with you, Troy. I get to choose my experience with you, Susie. I get to choose my experience with a job. I'm no longer a victim to my circumstances because I'm choosing now. And that's the access to, you know, stop looking for evidence that there's something wrong or stop looking for evidence that lets you off the hook for honoring your word and start looking for evidence that everything's perfect in the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, that gives you a lot of peace Yeah, trust that. I love that because that goes right back to one of our four core values. One is affirmation. Mm -hmm. And I love the word Mm -hmm. affirmation because you're not – coming up with something to encourage someone that you don't see but you are affirming if you have that positive mindset and you're looking for you are affirming the good you're finding that everyone has good everyone yeah 
and you're affirming that good in another person. Um, well, I can't possibly love another person unless I deal with myself too, right? So I've got to get yeah. rid of the negative over here. Yeah. Right? So you're absolutely right. It's affirming me as a, as a difference maker, as a human being, as someone I can love, being loving, and then I see it in you automatically. It's like, oh, Troy's just like me. What a, yeah. He must have changed. <laughs> <laughs> Because exactly. I don't remember him that way, right? <laughs> but it's all of a sudden my view starts to change because I have a, this particular view. Either it's empowering or it's going to be something that is hard work every day. Yeah. 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 It's so powerful, the power of the mind and having those positive thoughts and also speaking it into your life. Yeah. And also seeing the evidence, seeing what's happening when you're doing that and how great your life is today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's transition this a little bit because I, you've said this earlier i don't know if you remember it but you are very intentional about the word create we're mm. going to create this for mm. you you say that when you come in as a keynote i've heard you say that as an instructor and in my mind what you've been talking about with the evidence is you're talking about mindset and in our mindset for how we look at the day how we and and all of that so talk a little bit about that mindset and i'm going to create this for you and and creating that yeah you know, that's really good because i think that this creating i think a lot of people miss the mark you know like i can create a loving relationship right but i can't create it on top of an inauthentic way of being in the relationship yeah. right and one of the trainings i got they described it as called frosting on a mud pie <laughs> right that's a good that one. one yeah so one. I'm creating, but I'm creating on top of just this pile of mud that I haven't cleaned up yet. Yeah. So when I restored my integrity in my relationship, first I had to own that it was all me. Mm. I did all that. My thinking was distorted, everything, and I cleaned it up to the best of my ability. And then the moment I'm standing at nothing... Right? Like it's been received. She forgave me. Mm -hmm. We're at nothing. Now I can start creating a new relationship based on nothing and only on my say so instead of trying to fix something that was broken. Yeah. So if I have uh, distance in my relationship with people at work, if there's distance been created, first I got to take responsibility for the distance. Mm. Oh, one day I walked into the office, you were doing this, and I decided you weren't worthy of my attention. Yeah. So I've been ignoring you for six months. Mm. I did that. I want you to know I apologize for that. Mm. Now I'm at nothing. Now I can start to create. I promise that I won't disconnect again and we can become team and partners again fully. And I give somebody permission to call me out if I'm not my promise. That's huge. Give him permission. you got to give him permission, right? Because I can't see it until it's too late. Yeah. Until it's too late. You know, you can always see an accident about to happen, you know, right. but the person in it can't see it. Right? <laughs> you know, it's too late, yeah. right? Yeah. So clean up your integrity. Get to nothing. Once I'm at nothing, anything's possible. So create something that's possible. Right. Powerful. And very difficult to do. Very difficult. And I think it's, you know, admirable to be able to take a look at what, what you've done and atone for it and be authentic. That deepens any relationship, just that authenticity. Well, it's really funny because most of us, you know, we have a hard time cleaning up the stuff that we've <laughs> created because we don't want people to know that we're not perfect. Yeah. So true. Instead of all of us are doing the same thing, so I'm going to start the practice of cleaning up my messes, and then the people around me have permission to clean up their messes. Mm. So I can transform any environment by being a leader. And what does a leader do? Cleans up his integrity first. Walks around and apologizes for doing this or yeah. doing that and cleaning up. I did it with my construction company. I did it when I did this course. I came out of the course going, wow. You're so far off the mark here. You know, I was treating people the way I was treated, yeah. which wasn't very good. But I became a pretty good carpenter. And I said to myself, I made a decision called, oh, that's how you create good carpenters. 
You scream and yell at him and call him names all day. <laughs> Is that what you did? That's what I did inside oh, wow. of building my company because I wanted better carpenters. I was really doing it with the intention to bring their level up. Yeah. But in this course, I realized, no, I was just repeating my past. Mm -hmm. I wasn't creating anything brand new. So I came out of the course on the Monday morning and I got all my crew. It was really funny because I, I remember this like it happened. I had a brand new Tahoe, right? <laughs> had 300 miles on it. Yeah. Brand, still smelled really good. <laughs> the leather know? inside, right? Leather, <laughs> beautiful, yeah. right? Yeah. I had nine carpenters on the crew. I pulled them all on the front lawn and I said, listen, you guys, I want to clean something up with you. I've been a real jerk. Mm. And I want you to know, I, I really realize how awful I've been as a boss. You know, I'm really clear that any success that we have as a company is because of you. And I apologize. And I promise to be the boss you deserve. Mm. And I gave everybody a 15% raise across the board. We got health insurance for everybody. And then I made the stupidest comment ever. I said, how about I take you all out to lunch? <laughs> And, of course, it was a rainy, muddy oh, Monday, no. and they all climbed into my Tahoe. <laughs> <laughs> all uh -oh. nine of us in the Tahoe, and we went to lunch. Mm. But from that moment on, moment on I came, became one of the top builders in the area, one of the respected builders, mm. because I had a team that respected each other and respected us. And yeah. that wasn't going to happen without you as the leader taking the step. That's right. And now, now the crew got permission to clean up their messes. Right, they could start to see where. Oh, I, I said I'd be here for eight hours, and I only worked for six of them. Yep. Right now, they're leaving with no integrity because I led the way inside of opening the doors, and that's who I was for the rest of my company. Yeah, powerful. You always taught me, Greg, that um, if your integrity is out in one place in your life, it's out every place in your life. Well, you know, one of the things, Susie, we get it collapsed a little bit, right? We think that it, integrity is tangible, but it's not. We can never have it, right? So it's always on the way out. So what, So I have to really create a, an intention to operate, it, to be someone who operates with integrity and then keep my eye on it because what happens is when I create that intention, the first thing I do is I go to work and really focus on work. Okay, good. I'm gonna be and then I forget about my promise I gave to my wife and kids. Yeah. So, uh, oh, oh, no, I was so close. It's, I thought I had it here, and then it's out over here. Instead of, no, wait a minute, take a deep breath. Do the best you can during the day. Keep your word and your commitment to your family. If I'm committed to my family and I don't ha if I'm committed to my wife and I don't have a reminder in my calendar to share with her how important she is, then I'm really not committed to my wife. I'm crossing my fingers and hope it works out. Yeah. So I start to take actions consistent with somebody who's committed. Right. If I'm committed to getting on a plane to go to Florida, you better believe that what time the plane is leaving is in my calendar. Yeah. So if I'm committed to living with this woman for the rest of her life and really loving and showing my love, then I'm going to put something in my calendar to say, Greg, wake up. It's your turn to, to remind her who she is for you. Love it. Right. So powerful. Yeah. The power of intention also mm -hmm. is so important, isn't it? That's right. I mean, daily. Yeah. You, you use that daily. Talk a minute about that. Oh, well. When you, you know, get with, up in the morning. Yeah, without a target, I'm kind of wandering around, you know, and I still, I still get so distracted. I laugh at myself <laughs> so much. You know, for instance, I, somebody says, Greg, you need to watch this video, training video or something, you know, and uh, it's so difficult for me. So I sit in front of the computer with all the greatest intentions in the world, right? I turn the video on, and I'm okay, good, I'm going to do this. I got it. And then all of a sudden I look down at the corner of my desk, and there's, dust on the corner of my desk <laughs> and so while i'm watching the video i reach in the drawer and i'm dusting a little bit and i'll be dang within five minutes i'm vacuuming the living room and wondered what happened to my commitment to watch the video you right <laughs> yeah because Get watching the, yeah watching <clears throat> the video isn't a big enough game for me now watching the video so i could become a master at my craft would have me stay in front of that video mm -hmm. or watching that video so I can make a difference for you, Susie, or for you, Troy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit in front of that video, but I, without creating the intention of everything I do today is going to elevate my participation in life with the people around me. I'm stuck with vacuuming the living room <laughs> and, <laughs> and wondered how I got there again. Yeah. You know? How yeah. great is that, right? Yeah. To have that intention. Right. Bigger and, purpose. Yeah. And I know your intention is always to make a difference in other people's lives. Yeah. 
it, I mean, it really is. And just like every other human, I get distracted from it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, Greg, you've had such great success in your building business as a professional and also in your coaching. You're in the top 3% in the world of coaches. So tell me about that success. Tell me about, you know, how did reaching, did reaching higher play a role in that oh. along the way? And, and how did it play a role for you? Yeah. You know, Susie, I was involved with reaching higher long before I decided to be a coach. You know, you, I know, you yeah, were. Years and years. Years for, and years. You know, and... just because I had no idea that the coach was going to be the thing that I gravitated towards, right? But I was always committed to challenging myself. So when I said yes to reaching higher, it was because I knew I'd be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? Because you'd ask me to speak in front of people. You'd ask me to stand up and talk. To me, and that was like against the grain 20 years <laughs> ago. That was not something I wanted to do. So I always took, went on with reaching higher. And every time with reaching higher, I fell in love with people. I know. Don't yeah. you? Just... Oh, my gosh. I couldn't believe it. I'm in tears half the time <laughs> inside of, you know, some some 15-year-old sharing a secret that it took me to 37 before I ever would consider sharing. Yeah. And they're out, you know, providing an environment where a 15-year-old could say, you know, I don't feel very powerful. I don't feel like I'm enough. I don't feel like I'm smart enough. Somebody said this and it impacted me this way. I said, oh, my gosh, what an environment for people to keep the, their, their space clear. We're giving them an environment where they can speak it out in the world and they're listened to like no one's ever listened to them before. Yeah. I know. So it's just a special place, you know, and that's one of the things I'm committed to inside of my coaching is actually people experience never being heard like they, they're being heard when they're with me. Mm. I love that. Yeah. I love, so, yeah, that was going to be my next question is, you know, why now, Greg, when you're so busy, you know, with coaching and with all the other things you're involved with? I mean, you put ramps in on the weekend for people that are disabled. You're involved in so many good things to make a difference in, in people's lives. So why now are you so involved with Reaching Higher? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's uh, Reaching Higher is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And unless we get the lifestyle out in the community, then nothing's going to change. It's just going to be another insight, you know, and... And, I, you know, it might be an impossible task, right, where reaching higher is mainstream, but that's why I show up where reaching higher becomes mainstream in every school. Mm. That's now, our goal. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm, I might not be around to see it happen, it, but that's not – if I only play games that I can see an ending, then I'm really not playing a game that's worthwhile. Wow. And mm. being involved with reaching higher, I'm playing a big game that I can't even imagine the difference it would make for how many kids if it was just like math, science, reaching higher, basketball. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just in there. Why? Because it's a place where we teach people to share, open up, talk about, be leaders, start to sit next and put their arm around a kid next to them while they're sharing and they're in pain. We're teaching stuff that no one on the planet teaches. Yeah. I know. We're teaching you know? them to have empathy and the compassion yeah. and love for one another. And I just think I got that in the last five years. You know, why, why should we wait so long to teach our kids that and teach them how valuable? And the lessons we teach will just last forever. So I'm involved in, in, you know, small ways compared to the people on the front lines in the school now and the teachers and the, the mentors who come in and give their time and, and sit and just want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. You but know? it's the little things that make the big difference, Greg. Yeah. You know, with your video that you have there for negative beliefs and the, the, the seeds you planted in reaching higher, mm. it's made it rich. It's made it what it is today, all the things that you've done. Wow. You know? It's 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 small thing, you know, like you said. My stand is that it's just mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So... You know, I just see what you've done in your life and how you motivate other people. And, you know, hey, if all of us could just take that story away that isn't true about ourselves and live into the possibilities that yeah. life has for us, wow. Well, just at least recognize it for what it is. It's a story that I wrote. You yeah. know, I'm yeah. the novel. I'm the writer here, right? So... At any moment, I can start to rewrite another story, you know? Yeah. The one, and instead of being stuck with the one 
that I, you know. <laughs> the one that isn't working. The for one you. that isn't working. Sure, it's not providing sure. everything I want. So, okay, hold on. Let yeah. me write another one. Yeah. I always love yeah. how you say, is that working for you? And they go, no, that's not working for me. Do you want to do that anymore? No. Yeah, exactly. So, it's awareness. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I've been privileged just to be on the outside and know your relationship a little bit. And Susie, I know Greg's your coach. He is my light. He's my coach. And Greg, I've heard you come into a classroom that I've taught with Susie and said, Susie's my coach and has coached me. So <clears throat> Greg, as you know, Susie just got certified mm. as a coach yeah. herself and uh, is going to be coaching for reaching higher. Um, so talk a little bit about Susie as a coach in your life and what someone, if they're coached by Susie, what someone would get out of Susie coaching them. Gosh, it's, you know, you know, what I'm cautious of is word, words might limit what's possible. Mm. You know, it's mm. that experience, right? It's almost like somebody trying to describe God. Because when you try to describe huh. God, you're going to limit what's possible, right? So why would yeah. I describe Susie and her ability to coach? Because it would really limit what's possible for whoever's in front of her. Yeah. Right? It just puts limits on it. So I'm really cautious to speak about it. But I want you to, if if somebody was just to engage, first off, Somebody has to be committed themselves, yeah. right? And once I become committed to breaking through somewhere, there's no one I'd rather be than with Coach with, with Susie. Mm. There's no one I'd rather be because Susie's not going to muddy up the waters inside of my commitment. See, a lot of coaches will muddy up the waters inside of my commitment to produce the result they want to produce mm -hmm. because it, it gives them and feeds their ego, right? Yeah. Susie's going to be a stand for you producing what you want to produce. Mm -hmm. That's why I say it's, don't muddy up the water. A lot of coaches, a lot of therapists, n nothing against the professional field, right? But a lot of them muddy up the commitment instead of drawing the commitment to be bigger. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, anybody that works with Susie is going to find that. There's just a freedom and an ease, and you can fail, and you can make <laughs> mistakes, and you can be afraid, and all that's okay in Susie's presence. Yeah. All of it's okay. And in that space, you can start to fulfill on whatever you say you want to fulfill on. That's yeah. the most important aspect of coaching is that we fulfill on what, or they fulfill on what they say they want to fulfill on, not what I think is best for them. I agree. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's so, uh, it's so Thank true. Thank you for the kind words. Well, yeah. Susie, you've been a coach in my life, too. Mm. And, you know, you have the coaching blocks already built by the sessions that you created within Reaching Higher. And I just think it's going to be so powerful uh, for those to, what I like to say, close the farthest distance in the world, that distance between knowing and doing. And that's ultimately what you're going to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, I feel so honored, you know. Um, a lot of times when I coach, and I've learned so much from Greg all of these years that you've coached me, you know, and I realize that, you know, your purpose of just wanting to make a difference in people's lives is exactly what I've always had for reaching higher. And, you know, and I can carry that forward now in, in this arena also. And so I'm, yeah. I, I'm forever grateful. <laughs> you remember the, the phone call that I had the day I started my coaching class? Mm -hmm. How I was scared to death because it was all online, you know, and you talked me through that. And you said, it's great, you know, because the greater the fear, the more growth you're going to have. Mm -hmm. And so I just graduated and I mm -hmm. was like, whoa, <laughs> that's great. And right? that's what we're asking you our clients to do. We're asking our clients to invest in their success. Yeah. If, you, if you're not willing to invest in your success, and I'm an expert at taking shortcuts. <laughs> expert. I look at something and I go, okay. They say go this way. I think it's shorter if we went this way. <laughs> and that's where it took me so long to create the success that I really created in life because I never listened. You know, I always thought there was a short way, and the short way was to keep me comfortable. Yeah. The one that makes me uncomfortable is the one that's going to produce a result. So anytime somebody invests in a coach, it's uncomfortable. Mm. First off, they think it's uncomfortable because I – Am I getting taken advantage of or somebody's charging too much? And then I go, oh, great. If I'm going to invest in something else in myself and then not do it, right? Because yeah. that's the biggest fear. The biggest fear is saying yes and then not doing it, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like how many people have 
multiple gym memberships at home sitting on the counter. <laughs> That's true. Or you get out of bed and go to the gym and hang at the smoothie bar instead of the weight machine, <laughs> right? Because those are the smart ones, right? <clears throat> yeah, right. <laughs> but once you start to invest in the trainer, you actually show up and you train and you get the stuff that you came there for. Do you feel like it? Never. I have a trainer. I've never once in my morning going, oh, boy, I get to go do it again. No. And now when I walk out of there, I go, oh, that was awesome. Yes. But on the way there, my knees are popping. My ankles are popping. Everything's popping to get me from yep. my commitment. Right? So totally. as a coach, we hold people accountable for their greatness. Love yeah. that. Yeah. Love that. Greg, what a pleasure it was today. <clears throat> I mean, it just uh, you helped me today i know you helped Susie, and i know you helped our audience so mm. thank you for so great to be here thank, thank you, you so much for here. having me yeah yeah thank you greg